this was chosen, I got looking at the verse again that Brother Sowers wanted us to memorize. And the, the verse was there in First Peter chapter 2. It says, if uh, ye were, for ye were sheep having gone astray, and, uh, but ye have returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And that has a lot to do uh, with this as well. I, 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 when I read it, that's, that's really in keeping with what we're looking at today. But Luke chapter 15, <clears throat> the prodigal son, I love this story. It's one of hope. And so we'll start in, in verse 10. The title of the message this morning is, There's Forgiveness with God. Amen? There's forgiveness with God. Let's all stand, if you would, for the reading of the word. If you can, if not, I understand. <clears throat> Luke 15, verse 11. Some of these are short verses, down to verse 24. <clears throat> Actually, verse 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he said, I, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give, the, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And for a Jew that was, that was something horrible. Not even supposed to touch him. Not supposed to eat him or anything. And here he's feeding him. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself. He said how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. He had all this rehearsed in his mind what he was going to do. And he arose and came to his father, but <clears throat> when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servant, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for this story, this parable written for all times. The parable, we call it the prodigal son. Lord, I pray that it, uh, we would uh, get everything that it is that you want us to have this morning. I pray that you encourage those that need to be encouraged, strengthen those that need to be strengthened. Lord, if there's somebody here without Jesus Christ, uh, may they be saved today. Lord, we thank you for all that you've given us. Thank you for another week of, of safety and bringing us through, watching over us, feeding us, putting a roof over our head. We have so much to be thankful for in this country we live in. Lord, I pray you bless now and have your will in your way. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. <clears throat> there's forgiveness with God. Jesus very often spoke to the crowd by the use of parables. He would teach a parable to teach a truth. The story he would tell was not about real people, but the truth was real. Very true, very real and biblical. This parable that we read of this morning, he wanted to reveal by it, that there's forgiveness with God. There's full restoration. That's what he wanted to, to teach in this. 
We call this morning, we call this parable the prodigal son. The scripture does not use this title, but we like to use it. We take it from verse 13, and it says that not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. Righteous living means in excess. It is defined, it is given to luxurious, extravagant, wasteful living. We could even say sinful living. That's what he'd give himself. So we, we see, we call it the prodigal son because of this. We say that one of the two sons was a prodigal, and this is what the parable is about. I think in order to get a full understanding of this parable, we need to know who Jesus was telling this parable to. You go to the beginning of the chapter, chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, we see who he was addressing. It says in verse 1, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners. We are told he was a friend of publicans and sinners. A lot of times the, the only ones that would receive him, everybody else would reject him. But he drew near unto all the publicans and sinners, so those are two groups there, for to hear him. And then we see the religious crowd in verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, they did that most often, saying, This man receiveth sinners and, and eateth with them. How dare he? So, the publicans and sinners, the sinners, those who were still in their sins, those in this case would be those in the community were known as really vile and living wicked lives. But the truth is to be told, all, all four of these groups, were, were sinners. Amen. Uh, if, you, if you look at all of them. Then it was the publicans. That was the worst of the worst. I mean the publicans were tax collectors. But they were working for Rome. Who was their occupiers. And they would always take more than they were told. And so they were known as thieves. So the sinners, the publicans. And then there was the false religious crowd. In verse 2. They showed up and began to speak evil of Christ because he hung out with publicans and sinners. I'm so glad that God does. The crowd, the Pharisees and Sadducees, and I mean scribes and Pharisees, God never had anything good to say about them, about these, this crowd, the, the religious. Because they were hypocrites, they would tend to, they would profess or pretend to be holy and on the outside but behind closed doors they were something very opposite they lived the law to be seen of men they were pointing fingers here at Jesus and said look at him look at who he's hanging out with those public and sinners and because of this in mind this situation he started to tell them of a parable how God can and does forgive sins. I'm so glad that there's a God in heaven who is willing and ready to forgive. Amen. We've all experienced that. If you're saved here this morning. As far as the Pharisees and scribes were concerned, there was no hope for the sinners or the publicans. They would always stay and be like they were. They were a lost cause by them. I thank God that in this book, everyone is a candidate for forgiveness. Amen? Amen? Isaiah 59 verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Not shortened. He can't save. He can save just as well today as he did all through history when these words were penned. A Holocaust survivor, I've quoted this many times, it's so fitting for what we're saying this morning. Corrie Ten Boom, I've quoted this since I've been here. But he's, she said there's no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. And through this, this is what Jesus was reminding the publicans and the sinners, or this, this religious crowd. So in this parable, I believe Jesus wants to paint a picture by this parable of the prodigal son, paint such a, a, a picture of a society what would call an awful person. 
I mean, just the worst of the worst, kind of like what the religious crowd were calling these publicans and sinners. Paint this awful per pe person and then show the same crowd what God can do with such a person. I believe that's what this parable is all about. Let's read verse again, verse 11. Verse 11 through 13. The prodigal son. And he said a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them, not the eldest, the younger of them, said to his father, Give me the portion, Father, forgive me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, after it had been given to him, and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. We see here some things that as he's painting this picture for them of someone that was horrible, as we will see. First, we see that this younger son demanded his inheritance. He didn't ask for it, he demanded it. Under the customs of that day, the oldest would receive two-thirds of the inheritance. And the younger one, in this case, would receive a third of it. Unless we forget, it needs to be said that like today, an inheritance was not given until the person died. And here he is asking for it in front of his father's face, who is still yet alive. By him demanding it before then showed how uncaring, how calloused and disrespectful he was towards his father. Now, Jesus was painting this very awful individual through this parable. To make things worse, Jesus in his story said that once the son got his inheritance, that he collected all, verse 13, and he left town. Collected everything his father gave him and left town. According to the Mosaic law, lands and inheritance was to stay in the family. You didn't get rid of it. But he was given the inheritance, he took all, and he left town with his inheritance. He couldn't take his land and his, and his houses and all these things, so what did he do? He sold it all. He sold it all. He took all that inheritance with him. And once in a far country, he spent all. So these people said, this guy said, uh, let's, let's, where's the rope at? Let's string this guy up. A horrible individual. He spent all his inheritance, everything. He wasted his dad's inheritance. That was for him and to him. And we see it ended with him. After he had spent all, he didn't have anything to pass on to his next generation, to his kids. But he not only spent the inheritance of money value, but you see through the story, he also spent the inheritance of investment by his parents. Just like any parents, they tried to invest in their children, into their future, raise them in, with good integrity, integrity. Good godly values. You remember the stories that your parents taught you growing up? And explain this is why we do what we do. Trying to invest in us. Trying to make sure we live right, do right. This young man in our story threw all that to the wind. He threw it all away. His parents instilled all this in him. But he went into a far country and he spent all. Everything, money, everything that, got, that his parents had invested in him, he threw it all away. By this time, Jesus had gotten the crowd, I believe, totally against this young man. He was an awful individual. The same kind of picture that the religious crowds were trying to paint about these publicans and sinners. They were lost cause. He said, I can't believe this Jesus. If he's anything like he is, they say he is, and why is he hanging out with those folks? I know some people use that, that it's all right to hang out with such folks all the time. 
You know what? When, when you see it in the Bible, you know what it was for one purpose? To lead them to Christ. Amen? It wasn't just going out and doing all the worldly things with them like a lot of people try to use that for. But he had painted an awful picture and he showed the, the religious crowd <clears throat> these things about this young man. So according to Christ's parable, what happened to this prodigal son? Verse 13, it says that he was living it up. He was living it up. I'm sure he was thinking, boy, this is the life. Boy, that, back at home and everything was just boring. It doesn't get much better than this. I'm sure he began to think. But something happened that he wasn't counting on. So it isn't anybody that gets involved in sin. The devil never shows you the full picture, does he? He wasn't counting on that famine. It says a mighty famine. Like the saying says, sin will take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. The devil never shows you the big picture. Back when they used to advertise, remember the billboards? Remember the old days they had the billboards of um, Marlboro? It would show you a cowboy standing beside his horse and smoking. Remember they would show that on the billboards and also on TV commercials back when they allowed it? They said, boy, this is basically what they were saying by through the advertising. If you smoke this, this is what you're going to be. A cowboy and a horse. You get that instantly. But it didn't show you that same person coughing his lungs out. The devil never shows you that side. Back in the build, time of the billboards, when they showed the, the alcohol and, and hard drink and liquor and these things, they'd also advertise on the billboard. They show the party and everybody having fun. Oh, it's just it's a wonderful life. And a lady all dressed up, decked out all nicely, and, the, and people in, in suits and just having, a, as they used to say, a gay old time. You can't say that word anymore. It means something different. But it never showed you the lady the next morning with the black eye, destroyed marriage, and all these things. Never shows you that side of, of, of sin. Well, this young man, he wasn't counting on that famine. He wasn't counting on it, spending everything he had. And he found himself in a real predicament. Hebrews 11, verse 25 says, The sin is pleasure for a season. For a season. And then what after that? How many times will we, we reach out to people and they say, I don't need any of that. I don't want that. Or this person not too long ago that kept calling us and email, I mean, emailing us, emailing us, that how dare we put literature on his porch. I believe on Judgment Day, those things will be replayed back to him. We'll give an account for everything. On that day, things will be different. Sin is progressive. He spent all, famine came, and he left, it says, he began to be in want. That means he came up short. Sin will always do that. Now we're talking about a, a lost person and God's addressing the lost people. But that same sin is deadly for any people lost or saved. Amen? Ask Saul. Ask David. Ask Demas. Just go on and ask the Sapphire. Ask any of them. Uh, and uh, sin is destructive. It will destroy us. He realized that the world and all its glitter wasn't all what it cut out to be. Even the pig food started looking good. The devil will promise you the world but destroy you in the process. You know, I'm glad that our story does not end here. It would be a, one of despair and hopelessness, not only for that younger son, but for the whole human race. There would have been no hope for us if that's where it ended. But starting at verse 17, we are seeing this, the steps that he made.
towards the Father. And when he came to himself, that's where it started. He said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. His first positive step, it was that he recognized his condition. The same goes for us if we're not where we're supposed to be. It's our condition. That's the only hope. That's it's, You have people, a lot of times, they'll do that with the doctor. They know there's something wrong, but they won't admit it, and they won't ever go to the hospital. And something that was probably repairable, something that could have been taken care of, isn't. And they end up dying from it. The same like my, my aunt was like that. She had a particular cancer that was very, very treatable. Like 80, 90% cure rate. But she was so scared, and she waited and waited until it took her life. She would not go. And sometimes we can be like that also when it comes to things that we know in our life is not right. It says in verse 7, he says, when he came to himself, many came to his senses. He said, this is crazy. I'm sitting here, and my, my dad has all the food in the world. His servants are eating better than I am. And I'm looking at these, this corn husk, which is a pod. It's like a seed pod that grows, uh, they sit on a, a carob tree. Just dried old husk. He said, this is looking appealing. He said, Where, what am I doing? Once he thought about the situation, he had a change of heart. That's where we use the word repentance. And that verse was just before he started this parable, where he said, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one center, sinner that repenteth. There's a lot of people out there who do not believe in repentance. But repentance is, is, is needed for salvation. Amen? Amen? And so that is very important. And a lot of them are trying to preach that away as if it's a work. And it's not a work. It's a working of Christ. But he realized, he said, what his father had and what he needed. But most importantly, he realized, if I stay where I'm at, if I stay in this condition, I will perish. He said that here. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Realizing his condition. I have a preacher friend of mine, and some of you here know him as well, Brother Richards. Uh, I believe he's probably even preached here before in the past. But he's been in Germany for many years. And uh, his church supported us. I preached for him there and met singing. And uh, he said one of the hardest problem tr hardest things that I have to deal with here and with the Germans is that they are such in, in, in so many ways or in, compared to others such good people they're deeply religious they're very good in everything that they do I mean you, you ever heard of German engineering I mean good in all these things he says it's hard to get them lost they think they're okay I'm going to heaven I'm a good Lutheran, I'm a good Catholic, I'm all right. He said, my heart's job is to get them, make them realize that they're in need of a Savior. And so he said he deals with that a lot, that they can really see their condition. Romans 6, 23, of course, we know, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, the wages of sin is death. He realized this, the young man in the parable. James 1.15 says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Sin is death to anybody that handles it. To anyone. It's death to us if we don't go to the Father. Sin destroys. Jesus Christ is the only one that can stop in this old world from perishing. Second Peter chapter three verse nine says, uh, "Long he is, no, he is long suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." So at this point of the parable, Jesus began to show the publicans and the sinners that there was hope for them by showing that there was hope for this prodigal son in the story. I'm glad that there's hope for the sinner this morning. In verse 18 and 19, he started a chain of events that changed the young man 
It changed the young man's life around forever and changes anyone that follows what he did. Verse 18 says, I will arise and go. If he had stayed where he was, he would have died. He could have thought of all these things, these wonderful things. I need to go see the Father. I'm going to ask him. I'm going to do all these things. But if he had never got up and went, it would have never, it would have never amounted to anything. There's no time like the present. In the matter of the spiritual, don't put off tomorrow what we can do today. If God is speaking to your heart, do what this prodigal son did and arise and go and don't delay. The devil always, he's a procrastinator. He always wants us to wait for tomorrow. <clears throat> tomorrow might not ever come. Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. John, uh, James 4, 14, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is a vapor that appeared for a little time and then vanished away. We quote it to the lost. I don't we have any, anybody lost here this morning. But you know what? We quote that to the lost all the time. If they're in need of a Savior. But those same verses stand true to us. Our life is as a vapor. Our life is short. We look, we get into eternity and we're in heaven with Christ. We look back at this time, it just seemed like a bleep. I mean, it'd be so short. Life goes so fast. That's why the devil likes procrastination. He don't mind us. Yeah, that sounds good. This is the plan. This is what we need to do. Whether as an individual, as a church. That, that sounds good. But if we never arise and go with it, it isn't going to do anything for us. Secondly, part of verse 18, he says, I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned. This is important, as we well know. He was willing to confess his sin. This is what I'm going to do. Sin is what separates us from a holy and a righteous father. We need to confess to him, Lord, I'm a sinner. Whether we're lost or saved. Of course, we, got, we came to know Christ. This is what we did. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. What a warning to the Lord and to the saved. We try to cover up sin. We try to mask sin. But it's still there. God says, will not prosper. We cannot prosper if we just cover it up. There's only one thing that can take care of sin, and that's putting it under the blood. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the only way that it can be taken care of. Romans 10.10 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Getting right... It's getting right with God. Getting right with God always involves sin. Lord, forgive me. Lord, help me with this. Lord, I have trouble in this area. But Lord, please forgive me. And you know, we do that with the Heavenly Father. I'm getting ahead of myself here. But we do it with the Heavenly Father. You know what? He is He's willing and happy to forgive us. We get nowhere when we try to cover it up. One thing we see here thirdly in verse 19. He says, and, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. We see a change of his attitude. He went from being proud, demanding I want my inheritance, not care, concerned about his father, not concerned about the household, not concerned about his mother. I'm out of here. To say what he, we just read. We see that he said I am not worthy. He came to his father with humility. Humility. Allows us to get right. Humility allows us to. To be where we need to be. Pride destroys so much. 
that pride destroys marriages, pride destroys relationships amongst friends, pride splits churches, pride is the culprit. Through pride, through contention, pride is, brings contention. He was humble, but he didn't start out that way. In Psalm 9 and verse 12, he says, He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. A pride, one thing the pride doesn't realize and do not, does not recognize the trouble, the problems in their own life. Pride keeps them from doing that. You know what? Very often everybody else can see it. But the person that, is, that it involves it takes humility. He heareth the cry of the humble. In Psalm 10 and verse 17, it says, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. You heard it. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. Humility goes a long ways. Once he had the change of heart and he knew what he needed to do, he came with humility. James 4 and verse 6 says, very, very clearly. Don't get any clearer than this. In James 4, verse 6, it says, God resisteth the proud. He resists. I don't want, I don't have, I don't want to hear you. I don't want to touch. He resists. The proud. But give it grace unto the humble. And then in verse 10, he says, Humble yourselves. In the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Amen. So many people are looking for people to lift them up and lift this and look at me and look what I've done and look what I've accomplished. But it's a different thing when God's the one that's doing that. And it's really, it's more noticeable. So our story started in one of despair and all things going wrong. A life without hope, no chance of ever changing, as the religious crowd thought of the public and the center, and some with no future. But God showed them different through this story. Praise God, our story doesn't end that way. We see in verse 20, starting in verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. You notice that it says, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Do you think that was by, by chance or by coincidence? What does that tell us? He was looking for him. May this be the day that he returns. I believe he got up in the mornings like we do and had coffee. Looking, we watching. He saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said, as he said he would, Father, I have sinned against heaven, confession. And in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. You know, God always gives his best. He gave us his son, didn't he? God gives, and I love that song that we sing, give up your, the best to the master. He wants our best, not our worst. He, he wants the, the best of our life. And he can really change our, our life or build our life into something that's worth living. Amen. And he does that for us. Put the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. That was showing full restoration, showing full forgiveness. And it says, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. And for this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. We won't look at the latter part. That's a different subject. Another, another uh, part of the story we won't look into this morning. But it shows no matter how awful a person is, God can still forgive. How many times you've talked to somebody about their soul and they said, but you don't know what I've done. 
You don't know what I've done. And I, I said, no, I, I don't. But God does. And he's still willing to forgive. Psalm 130 and verse 4 says, There is forgiveness with thee. Praise God. Again in Acts 13 verse 38, But it be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, speaking of Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Jesus forgives. I love that song, one of my favorite ones we just sang. There is power in the blood. Amen. Power, power, power. Wonder-working power. If it wasn't for the blood, there would be no hope for us or for the world or for eternity. But he's willing to forgive. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And because we have forgiveness of sins this morning, Psalm 40, verse 2, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. Praise God. What God can do for us. I was not, we were knocking doors, handing out literature yesterday. And I came across this, this man and <clears throat> he had just moved in there. And um, he told me he had kids and he said they lived for church. And you can see by his life that he did not. And I wasn't, I'm not being harsh, but you can see he had been and is still living a very rough life. Involved in drugs and these things. And I said, how many kids do you have? And he said, I've got seven. This man wasn't very old. He said, from 18 to age four. And I said, well, if you'd like, I said, we can come and pick your children up. He said, okay. I said, call me whenever you're ready. And uh, we can bring your children. He said, all, all I've got is three with me. He said, but they would love to come to church. And, uh, but I looked at his life. And the rest of that day, I looked at it. And I said, you know what? If it wasn't for the grace of God, that would be me. That would be me if, if it wasn't for the grace of God. Sometimes we think too highly of ourselves. We forget from the pit, the pit that we were dug. Sometimes meekly we have sometimes we strut our stuff. We have nothing to glory in. If it wasn't for the grace of God. I couldn't get that out of mind. I looked at him. Where sin had taken him. Leaving him in bondage. Many are still sitting. In the pig pen. But we need to tell them there's a savior. There's a savior. That is willing to forgive. And to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. That we got to be, we need to tell far and wide, we need to tell everyone that we see that there, there reigns a king that's died for them. That God wants to forgive them their sin. Many will refuse, but we can't stop telling. God wants man to turn to him. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants man to be right with him. That's why he sent his only begotten son, like Miss Shirley said earlier. Not for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? Because he's not willing that any should perish. And that all should come to repentance. They all should be saved. Lord, we love you this morning. Thank you for the attention of your people. And I love them so much. Lord, I pray that you would Help us to take these things that we've looked at in this story of the prodigal son. Help us to meditate on these things. And Lord, it calls us all, one of the things to, to walk away, to look and, and be so thankful that Lord, as the Father was in this story, so you were and are to us this morning. You gave us your best. Give of your best to the Master. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your goodness to us in Jesus' name. Amen.